Hi, welcome to Viewpoint. I'm Lily Newman, the host, and joining me is my co-host, Susan Salomon, the Executive Director of Drug Crisis in Our Backyard. Welcome, Susan. I'm glad you're here. Hi, Lily. Hi. So nice to be here. Today, we are honored to have Robert Langley, Jr., Sheriff of Putnam County, as our guest on Viewpoint. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate you taking time out of your very busy schedule to come on Viewpoint and tell us a little bit about yourself and your initiatives in Putnam County. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. And, you know, my, my whole life I've just really been a public servant. Uh, 18 years old, started in the volunteer fire service. At 20 years of age, I was hired by the Putnam County Sheriff's Office gotcha. and the Department of Corrections. In 1986, I went on to patrol, mm -hmm. served as a canine handler, served as emergency dispatcher for 911, went on to criminal investigations and forensics and identification, and in 2007 I retired. Um, I mean, my whole life has really been dedicated to serving the public, and it's just a good feeling to be able to do that. So do, after you graduated college, you went right into the... Um what was the first thing you did? Volunteer. Volunteer fire service. You went right into at, that? At, at 18, I went at, into oh, that. After I, high school? Right after high school. Oh. I've worked my entire life. And um, during my career with the sheriff's office, I've gone to John Jay College, uh, Rutgers University, and the University of New Haven. To get d different degrees in? Training in the law enforcement field. And you've been in areas. And you've been in Putnam County your entire career. Right. My entire career, I've grown up in Putnam County. Oh, I, I was a Carmel yeah. resident, a Mayapack High School graduate. That's nice that you're in the community that you grew up in, that you're serving. It's a definite benefit, and uh, I could think of no better county to live in than Putnam County. It is a beautiful county. We have some, we have some really beautiful lakes mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. here, and it's pristine. Very, very it's beautiful place to live. It's a country. I know growing up in the Bronx, this was the country. When you came up here, this was absolutely the country. Yeah, and I grew up in the Bronx too. Removed, right? <laughs> yes. So it was very different. <laughs> no, it's, there's, there's a lot to offer in Putnam County. You know, from the east side of the county to the west side of the county, it's two different worlds. You know, traveling across the county through Fawnstock State Park is mm -hmm. absolutely beautiful. And I have the pleasure of uh, that being part of my commute. Mm. and driving through that tranquil area. Yeah, from, uh, from Garrison. Cold Spring. Yeah, Cold Spring. So that's, we call that the western side of the county. Correct. Yeah. So um, um, what made you, no, you know what I ask you, you said you were a dog handler? Canine handler, yes. Okay, so how was that? That sounds like a really interesting kind of job. It's the best partner you can have with you out there on the street. Uh, you have that companionship, that loyalty and dedication, knowing that there's someone there to help you when you need the help. And there's nothing more gratifying than finding someone who's lost or distraught, mm -hmm. missing out in the woods with your canine partner and just making a difference in their life and getting them back to safety. So that was part of your, um, I guess, job when people would get lost, you and the, your canine partner would go out and find them? Correct. Wow. So you see on TV, they give them a piece of clothing. Correct me. I'm a little dramatic. They give them a piece of clothing. <laughs> they, they smell it, and then they, they get on the trail of the person? In, in some cases, okay. you would do that. Mm -hmm. um, if it's like a, an old trail for uh -huh. the dog to follow, we call it tracking. Okay. Uh, bloodhounds are trailing dogs. Got it. But if it's a fresh mm -hmm. scene, we just cast what's called casting, mm -hmm. and we locate the track that the person That's made amazing. fleeing the area or just wandering off. Okay. So fleeing the area is someone that's trying to get away. Someone that's trying to get away, someone who just broke into a business or a mm -hmm. home and ran off into the woods. And so I understand they have, do they have any canines now for narcotics? Currently we have two canines that are dual trained. They're patrol dogs and narcotic detection dogs. We have another two patrol dogs that are dual trained as bomb detector dogs. Wow. And we also have a arson detector dog and a bloodhound. So you have, what's that, five, six? Six, six oh, dogs. Oh, that's a lot. That's great. So, so you've got everything covered. 
We do. That's great. And where are they uh, kenneled? They go home with their handlers every night. Oh. At the end of their shift, they go home. They're part of their family. Yeah. They are family. And you could have that partner for as long as your career is in that unit. Yeah, that's your partner. That's your partner that, for us. They stay together, and when the dog retires, the dog gets to retire with his uh, handler. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, I see. That's great. So they stay together. Yes. That's nice. That really is. It really is. Yeah. So where are they trained? They're trained through different areas. Uh, we have some dogs that have been trained through the New York State Police, mm -hmm. others through the Orange County Sheriff's Office. Uh, our newest dog was already trained. That dog's handler had previously trained through the New York State Police. So the officer's trained. Mm -hmm. mm. So it only makes sense to give him a dog that's been trained. It, it saves on time sending mm -hmm. him to a 16-week mm -hmm. canine training academy. Yeah. So oh it go from 16 weeks to two weeks. Oh, wow. And do you find that, let's say, the narcotics dog? I mean, they're just out in the community, the dog, and, you know, its partner, they're out in the community, and it could smell, I guess, narcotics someplace? Is, I don't understand how that works. Well, it's, it's not just the dogs walking around says, hey, there's some, <laughs> there's some drugs over here. Let's, <laughs> um, the, the handler and the dog work together. They are a team and the dog operates off the cues that the handler gives to the dog. So if they suspect there are narcotics in an area, the handler will instruct the dog where to send okay. for narcotics. So, so how, so how did much. you wind up uh, running for uh, sheriff? Well, 2007 I retired and I got to spend a, a lot of time with my wife and just enjoying being with each other. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I mean, that, that's my best friend. She's my support. That's great. Um, and then June 22nd, 2017, a mutual friend asked if I would consider running for sheriff. So my wife and I discussed it, and we decided to move forward with it. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't for her <laughs> keeping me going, yeah. I wouldn't be sitting here today. <laughs> It's good to have you because reading your history, you really are a public servant in every sense of the word from the beginning of your career to now to come out of retirement to serve your community and the people that are in it. I don't live in Putnam, but I thank you. And thank you. Um, you know, the position, it's never about me as an individual right. or it should never be about whoever holds that position mm -hmm. as sheriff. This position is about the community you live in and serving that community. It's not about serving yourself. Right. You know, community is vital and they come first. So what do you see the ch changes or with the opiate epidemic, how do you see that um, affecting Putnam County? Well, as everyone is aware, we do have a major crisis in our county with the opioids. Under my administration, we are making the differences that we can through the jail, through patrol, through community services. Uh, currently, we're getting off the ground, implementing Narcotics Anonymous in the jail in cooperation with Arms Acres. Arms Acres is also be coming down to the jail to help with people being discharged to see if there are outpatient candidate or an inpatient oh, candidate. Okay. We have the Department of Social Services on board who will come in to do the face-to-face -to, -face to make sure That's all great. the paperwork is in place that they need for their Medicaid. So when they are released, they have the insurance they need. We have a pharmaceutical company on board who will be coming in to administer Vivitrol for people who are qualified That's great. to receive that medication so that they don't have that urge Everything is being structured, and it's being structured through the professionals. We don't want to make mistakes. Right. We don't mm -hmm. want people to fail. We want everyone to succeed. We don't want that door at the sheriff's office to be a revolving right. door. When someone is released, we want them to succeed. Yeah, that's great. Is that a model that your department and other professionals have come together to have set up? Um, because I don't know if that's a model that's in other counties well, that extensive. Some, some, uh, Stuff up in Albany. Okay. 
that's making similar to this that you know they they don't want to release um, inmates mm -hmm. they don't want to release them without giving them Vivitrol Got because it, it is life-saving uh -huh. as you know uh -huh. and so and the relapse rate right. when they leave right. jail is enormous so many people Die. Yeah, and they die within a or short relapse of time. and then they're back in jail right. so as you said it's a revolving door so so these programs that you have set in motion now really should make a difference in terms of the people ha coming back I, I hope it does I really do I don't I really don't want anyone to fail we're going to give them all the tools uh -huh. that they need to succeed the only thing we can't do is when they're released we can't be there to right control right. when and where they go they need well to if they you know what if they have um, if they're going to outpatient there are ways to have a warm transfer from mm -hmm. your jail to wherever they're going that's why we have professionals on board yeah so that they can handle that end of it right you know, once they're outside the right. office the sheriff's office we can't control them anymore right other organizations well, that's part of having mm -hmm. the tools in place. Right, right exactly. Right. So that makes a big difference. They have that support that's system. Right. Makes a huge difference because they have to go if they go to a place for an appointment, they don't have Medicaid. Then they got to come back, or they or they can now fill it out there. But now a person knows they've got all their ducks in a row. It makes it a lot easier. Absolutely. And the Medicaid is a big part. A big part. A huge part they get of it. Services, and you don't have to wait. There's no lapse. The way that, you get it. Are they doing that down in Westchester too, do you know, with the Medicaid? I don't know release from Valhalla if yeah. they're doing that, but that's a very good question. And they should take your model well, and put it every county jail. I'm very fortunate with the administration that I brought in with me. Mm -hmm. um, our captain, Kevin Traverco, was the commissioner of corrections for Westchester County. Okay. 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 And he is invaluable. Got it. The resources that he has brought to the jail here in Putnam County, the knowledge he has brought. The hurdle that they're trying to overcome in Westchester County is getting DSS to their correctional facility. Uh -huh. Yep. Mm. Uh, whereas, again, Putnam, we're very fortunate. Everybody works together. Yep. And DSS, Mike Piazza, he's on board right. and Makes a cooperating. Makes a huge difference. And the other thing is the jail is receptive. So a couple of years ago, we went in to see um, Lieutenant Hanley about starting a program uh, for the men, an educational program, and they were very receptive to, uh, to us coming in once a week and doing um, addiction education with the men. So uh, it's important that the jail have an open mind as well as the people in the county government being willing no, absolutely. It, it, it goes beyond just the jail and, like you said, county government. It also goes out to law enforcement in and of itself. Mm -hmm. You can make a tremendous difference in someone's life. A police officer has the power of discretion. That's right. You don't always have to arrest someone, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but if you can get them into a rehabilitation center and guide them, mm -hmm. you make that difference. Right. If you do arrest someone, you could still make a difference. You get them into a drug court. You mm -hmm. get them into a diversion right. program. Right. Now, incarceration is not always the answer. That's right. Right. So what percentage would you say of um, your inmates are drug-related offenses? I would have to say probably 90%. That's a lot. Wow. That's a lot. All your property crimes are usually connected to some sort of substance abuse. They're yeah. trying to support their habit. Mm -hmm. You know, when the funds get cut off at home, right. then they resort to stealing. That's right. Mm. Yeah. And there has to be something in all the county jails that addresses that issue, the drugs. Oh, absolutely. And it's not just on our part mm -hmm. to deal with the opioid crisis. Right. Education, and that starts in the home.